child of God. Death has no hold on me. He's already won the victory for us. Y'all sing this last verse with us. There was a battle, a war between death and life. There on the tree, the Lamb of God was crucified. every key he rose up as a lion now he's setting the captives free there ain't no prayer
enjoy our worship time and I always get real nervous during that last song because I know that I'm coming up next and I pray that I can be the Lord's servant, His messenger because it is my priority as a pastor for you to have a personal connection with Christ when you come here for for church, that we would not just run through a program, and, um, but that honestly all the different pieces would be ordered of the Lord in such a way that you might be able to have that, that moment that God reserved just for you. And, and it's, it's different for everyone. You know, sometimes it's in a moment of greeting. Uh, sometimes it's when a song is being lifted up in worship. Other times it's something that somebody says in a prayer. Uh, sometimes it's something that, that God puts in the heart and in the mind of the preacher to bring. But it's, it's not just w one of any of those things. It's a combination of. Uh, I remember early in my years of ministry, there was this uh, philosophy about church services that seemed to be the... Uh, overriding philosophy, and that was that everything that happened up until the moment when the preacher stepped in the pulpit was just preparatory to that moment. And I see it differently than that, and a lot of people do see it differently than that now, because it's, it's not that everything works up to this moment, it is that in all that we are experiencing here, God is reaching into our lives in different ways. And sometimes God touches your heart during a certain song being sung, that when the preacher gets up, it's kind of like Charlie Brown, you know, wah, 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 wah. And that's okay. I'm not, I'm not threatened by that. Because the main event is not the preacher. The main event is Jesus Christ. And it, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And I want you to be drawn to him. I don't want you to be drawn to me. I want you to be drawn to him. And whatever God has chosen to use in this time this morning to allow that to happen, uh, praise his holy name. There's no way we can prepare for that uh, in totality. We prepare uh, that we might have some order in the things that, that happen. But having said that, there's no way that we can prepare in such a way to know that this means this and that means that. And this is the way it's all going to fit together. Uh, consequently, one of the, one of the uh, stands that we've taken as, as leaders here in this church, we, we don't get together and have a planning meeting about the worship service. Well, that's slack, Ron. But no, here's why we don't. We don't want this gathering time to be a person's idea. We want it to be the dynamic of God. 
And so I know that if the Lord leads me in this moment of declaring His Word, that He will lead John and Kevin in the worship that needs to happen. And what's really cool about that is many times we will get to the end of a service and we'll say, oh my goodness, that's incredible that God put that song in this week because it absolutely became a a confirmation of what He was doing as the service fit together. So all of that, I want you to see Jesus this morning. I want you to have a connection with Him this morning. And it's bigger than I am. I can't make that happen. The worship team can't make that happen, but the Holy Spirit can make that happen. And so as we spend this time together, I pray that that will be your experience. Jeremy mentioned his word, walk. And my word is present. And um, my Becky's word is joy. Um, So if you have a word just right now, would you all tell me all together, what is your word? Oh, that's all. That's music to my ears. Seriously, because God has moved us in this direction together and He's, he's given us a word. And, and as I shared with you in, in January, can you believe it's already February? What happened with the groundhog? I don't even know. Springs early. Okay, good news. It's been kind of a mild winter. That's all right with me. Um, but anyway... Uh, God has moved us to our Word, and as I've shared with you in in January, I I didn't want to just decide on a Word. I wanted God to give me a Word, and He gave me present. And uh, I needed that because I um, I realize, and I've I've told you this before, but I realize now that when I was a kid in school, I I was an ADD kid without drugs. All you have to do to... To confirm that is go to my dad's house and he's got this box of keepsakes that mom passed down and my elementary school report cards are in there. And wherever the teacher makes comments, you know, maybe on yours there's a sentence or two. Mine, it's a paragraph or two. And basically they were all saying the same thing. He won't stay in his seat. And that didn't work out real well. So ADD has caused me just to kind of bounce from here to there and look to the next thing and the next thing. And God spoke to my heart and and said, I want you to be present. I want you to be present in the moment. I want you to be present with people. And when you're with someone, when you're face to face with someone, I want you to be with them. Dialed in. Tuned in. So that's my word. And and the verse, uh, Jeremy gave a verse, so I'm going to give you a verse. And The verse for me in this is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things that are happening will be added as God sees fit. And so my priority in being present is that God's kingdom may come in our lives, may come in my life, might come in our lives as we relate with one another. um, Because that's the best that life can be when His kingdom comes. My prayer is that everybody here, that your heart is open to Jesus that you have asked Him because of His death on the cross to forgive your sins. If you haven't done that, I pray you will do that this morning. That you'll ask Jesus to bring His forgiveness, His redemption to your life. I pray that you will open your heart to Him not only to receive forgiveness, but I pray that you will open your heart to Him that you might see yourself as God sees you. Because when you find yourself in Jesus, then you've really found yourself. And until that happens, you're you're searching for yourself. I pray that you will open your heart to His forgiveness, but also that you will open your heart to see yourself as He sees you. I pray that you will open your heart to live for what He would have you to live for. And that you'll let the rest of the stuff fall by the wayside. Because it's, it's a shame how... Satan can cause us to be weighted down by things that in the final analysis, don't really matter. I pray that you'll open your heart to what He wants you to live for. I pray that you will embrace your family and your friends. Because over and over again, life teaches us that we have this moment. And we dare not continually put off the relationships that God has brought us to, particularly with our families. 
but also with those close friends who have become like family, that we would understand the priority of giving ourselves to one another, to those relationships, and not letting other things rob us of those opportunities. That we would be intentional about going out to dinner with those friends that we've been meaning to get together with. That we would be intentional about about having those family gatherings that are centered on special days like birthdays and anniversaries and such, that we, we wouldn't rush past them and make excuse that we got tied up in other things. We have to be intentional about these things and set our priorities in such a way that God comes first, family comes next, and that friendships are a high priority in the mix of life. I pray that you will see the value in moving forward in life and not enshrine the past and become a prisoner to what was. To understand that yes, we've had some glorious times together, but the best is yet to come because of the glory of who God is in our lives. The God who, gave us those, who has given us those precious memories is giving us today and is giving us the tomorrows that He has planned for us. God, help me to move forward and not to fall back. Help me to move forward and not become paralyzed by the fears of that are represented in the changes that are all around us all the time. I've enjoyed Genesis in the month of January as I've been giving myself to my daily Bible readings. And here's a nugget from Genesis. Genesis chapter 45, verses 19 and 20 in the New Living Translation. Joseph has ended up in Egypt. His brothers sold him into slavery and and they meant it for evil, but God used it for good. And Joseph has become second in command in in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh has given him full reign. And Joseph, because of God's anointing upon his life, because of the leader that God made Joseph to be, and make no mistake about it, Joseph got that. He said to Pharaoh on the occasion when Pharaoh asked him to interpret his dream, he said, I cannot interpret your dream, but God can. The God I serve can can help me to help you understand what He's saying to you. And he interpreted the dream. And the dream meant that there were going to be seven years of bounty and then there would be seven years of famine and the famine would be so multiplied that it would that it would eat up the years of plenty and leave people in peril starving to death and so Pharaoh put Joseph in charge and and he for seven years during the bounty during those bumper yield seasons he stored up grain for the future And when the famine hit, and especially when they got into the second and the third year of the famine, and it was only going to get worse, but it was really bad, even in the second and third year, people were coming to Egypt, coming to Joseph to buy grain. The famine was not only happening in Egypt, it was happening in Canaan. And so Joseph's dad, Jacob, and all of his brothers and their families were subject to the famine. And Jacob sent his older boys to go to Egypt to buy grain, had no idea that they would be buying grain from his son, Joseph. And he went, he, the boys went to Egypt, the sons, and bought grain. And as you read the story, and it's a great story, read it um, sometime soon. You come to the place in the story where Joseph has revealed himself to his brothers And now they are sending for his father Jacob and they're going to move Jacob and all the families to Egypt. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I want you to give your family the best opportunity in the the best part of the land and whatever they need, it's theirs. And I want your brothers to become the ones who are watching over the flocks of Pharaoh, and I want, I want them to take care of all of our livestock. So God just took care of Joseph's family in an amazing way. And that's where this nugget is found. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, take wagons from the land of Egypt to carry your little children and your wives and bring your father here. Don't worry about your personal belongings. Oh, I need that in my life, don't you? Don't worry about all the details of what to bring and not bring. You know, uh, should we take the washer and dryer or should we buy a new one? I'm sure they 
they had a different uh, take on that than I'm giving you. But he said, don't worry about their belongings, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. And as I read that, I thought about the words of Jesus to His apostles when He was sending them out in ministry. He said, when you go, don't take a purse, don't take any extra money, don't take any money. Don't take an extra set of, clo uh, of, of clothing. Don't take an extra pair of shoes. Don't, don't take provisions whatsoever. I'll provide everything you need. All I want you to do is to be present in the moments that I'm going to give you to minister the, the saving news of the kingdom to those that you'll come into contact with. You do that and I'll take care of everything you need. Seek you first the kingdom of God and seek God's righteousness, and whatever you need, I'll provide it for you. Man, if I can live that way, there's a whole lot of stress and worry that's taken off my back. If I can really believe that all I need to do is take care of relationships that God is blessing me with and He'll take care of everything else, it's life-changing. People should always be the priority. People should always be the priority. When I am facing another day and the decisions that come with that day, if people are the priority in my life, then I am going to decide to make the moves that will allow me to be freed up to be with the people that God would have me to be with in any given moment. There was a day early in my life as a minister that, and I'm ashamed to say it, but I was so, I was so focused on my to-do list that if you came in and you weren't on my calendar of appointments, you were an aggravation to my life instead of a blessing. I'm ashamed to admit that. But God saved me from that. And He helped me to see one day that people are the reason that I am called to be in the work that I'm involved in. And that when God brings someone to my to my Space, if you will, brings someone into my life. They are never an interruption. They are the priority. And everything else should be laid aside because God has given a divine appointment for something to happen in that relationship that is crucial not only to their lives, but to my life. I am so, gl so glad that God saved me from an agenda-driven existence and brought me to the place in my life where I understand that when you and I have, when we come into contact with one another, not only here at church, but in the community, and He brings us face to face, that there's glory in that moment and there's a reason for that moment, people are always the priority. Now I know some of you work in an environment where sometimes it's difficult to live, live that out. But still, in any environment, we need to find the way to navigate the responsibilities that are laid before us that we understand that the real treasures in our lives are each other. Because there will come a day when there will be people who are no longer present and you will understand that if you could have just one more opportunity to talk with that person or to be with that person, you would give everything that you have materially to have that moment. And what I'm saying is, God help us to live that conviction while we do have the opportunity. You know, there are some things... Y'all, I can walk through Simpsons and every time I do, I see things I did not know I needed so badly. <laughs> How in the world have I lived without a pair of boots like that? 
Well, I've got a pair of boots. Well, I'll give them away. I'm going to get those. And more and more, God is showing me to let go of some of that influence, materialistic influence, in order to take hold of the things that really matter. Pharaoh said, Joseph, tell your family, just bring each other, don't worry about everything else, everything they need. I will provide for them. It's amazing the things that we thought we could not live without, and so we kept them. It is amazing when we run across them 10 or 15 years later, we say, oh wow, there it is. And then I put it away again for another day. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have mementos. I get that. They represent something about relationships. But there's such a word of wisdom in what Pharaoh is saying to Joseph and what Joseph passes on to his family. And as I was looking at this story and I was opening my heart to it and saying, God, please show me how to wear what you're showing me in this passage of Scripture. One of the things that the Lord brought to me is, Ron, things change. And resisting change will leave you impoverished in so many ways. You may be hanging on to what you think is most valuable, but when you hang on to that which I would have you to let go of, you're missing the opportunity to take hold of the something next that is bringing value in that moment in your life. And so God was challenging me this week to, to be sure that, that I am not clinging to the relics of the past. And I, y'all, I'm not just talking about things we put in that memento box. I'm talking, I'm talking some about the way we do things. That this is the way we do things. To let go of that mentality. And to understand that there... Um, someone last week was asking me about new wine and, and new wine skins and new wine and old wine skins and, and what does that represent. And, and, and so we talked just a moment about that and, and basically uh, God brought that back to me this week. I think He had me that, have that conversation because He was setting me up for, for what He wanted to show me. And what God said to me this week is that, um, that when new people come and they bring new ideas about how we do what it is that God would have us to do in ministry with one another. That we understand that, that sometimes God is giving us a new wine, a new experience of His grace that needs to be packaged within new containers, that we might, new methodologies, new way of seeing things that allow us to continue to do the same old work of bringing people to Christ, but to do it in such a way that it becomes powerfully uh, effective in the present, in their lives. Now, I'm not saying you toss everything. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that as God gives us another day, He's giving us an opportunity to make a difference in that day in the ways that He would have us to do that. And I have to be present in that moment for that to happen. And to be present in the moment means I have to let go of some of what I have enshrined in my life as being the best. And God said, I want, I want to show you that there's an opportunity if you'll let go of the past to some degree that there's an opportunity to take hold of the new thing that I'm wanting to bring to your life. In order to get there, God has to be first in our lives and people have to be the highest priority. Things change. And resisting change will hurt us, not help us. It was time for Jacob and his family to move to Egypt. As much as they had cherished Canaan, this chapter was to be written in a foreign land. God was up to something that was bigger picture than Jacob or Joseph or any of them could understand. I shared with Wednesday night and Wednesday morning Bible study that in that storyline there's a place where 
where Joseph says to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, that a remnant might be saved in order to experience a full deliverance. Joseph did not even understand what he was saying in that moment. Because what God was doing was not only for Jacob and his family, but it was for you and I. God was saving a remnant at that time in the midst of that desperate famine that the line that would lead to Jesus Christ, that would result in Him going to the cross to die for our sins, was being represented in that moment historically. Joseph didn't get that, but God knew that. And God was positioning His chosen people in such a way that the story might continue to unfold and the day would come years later when Moses would deliver the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. And all of it was a part of the plan. Always a part of the plan. And God has a plan. Not only for Joseph, but for you and for me. And for us to live in the present moment of that plan means that sometimes we have to let go of what has always been in order to take hold of what is about to become a new reality. And it's hard to do that because I like familiar surroundings. Don't you? It doesn't happen as much in these days as it used to happen at the old church. But there were these rascals who would go in my office while I was preaching. God have mercy on their souls. Amen. And they would mess up my desk. I mean, my books are at a certain angle. My stuff is where I put it. And you go in and move it, and I know it's been moved. And they would go in and mess everything all up. And as soon as I walked in, I would know, and I'm not going to name them. One of them's here this morning. (laughs) No names to protect the innocent. I'm not even looking in his direction. I'm going to look beyond him. (laughs) But I knew as soon as I walked in, that's not how I had my stuff. And honestly, innocent fun, always a fun time. But in real life, we get it ordered the way we like it. And it's, we're not saying that everybody has to order it that way, but that's the way. That's the way. And God said through Pharaoh to Joseph to Jacob, just bring the people of your family. Don't bring all the stuff. I got new stuff for you that's better than you ever dreamed possible. And I believe... The God who is the author of that story is speaking to us this morning and saying, let go of the old stuff that's keeping you from the new blessings that I'm wanting to pour out in your life. Dare, dare to let go of some things that I might bless you and bless your family in new ways. It might have to do with schedule. It it could have to do with any number of things that have become the routine for you. And God's saying, let me give you something new that will help you as you face your tomorrow. And is there anyone here this morning who's willing to trust God that much? Who's willing to say, Lord, I'm going to lay myself and my family and all that is my world, I'm going to lay it at your feet this morning. And you give me and my family and my friends what you want us to have. And here's the the cool thing. He may give you back some of what you've laid down at His feet. But what He does not give you back, He'll give you something better in place of that. Isn't that awesome? Somebody asked me one time, 
I was preaching about how we need to make ourselves totally available to God and that if He wants us to go to Africa to do missionary work, that we need to be willing to go. And the person, the lady came up to me afterwards and said, do you really believe that God wants me to make myself and my kids, my family, available to go to Africa. Do you really believe God wants us to go to Africa? I said, I don't know if He wants you to go to Africa, but I know He wants you to be available to go there just in case He wants to send you there. And so often, we have said, God, I'll do this much, but I won't go beyond that. I'll do this, but I'm not going to do that. Is there anyone here who believes in God enough to say, without exception, here's everything. Give me what you want me to have. The ones who would dare to trust Him that way, the outcomes are glorious. Beyond imagination. Joseph, Take the carts to Canaan and get your daddy and all the wives and kids that belong to your brothers, but don't bring any stuff. It's a new day for you and your family. Anybody need to just lay some old stuff down today for that newness that God is wanting to bring to our lives? Anybody here need to confess before the Lord just in your heart God, I've been too wrapped up in stuff and have not been devoted enough to my family, to the friends that you've put before me. I've said no, no, no to so many opportunities to be together with people. God, help me with that. I visited with someone this week and uh, as a matter of fact, Becky and I visited this person together. And this person is a member of our church family. And this person looked at us and said, I miss church so bad. Becky pulled up a YouTube while we were there on her phone and, and played the song that we sang last week. I want to stroll over heaven with you. And tears were rolling down this person's face. This person didn't ask about if we knew if their house was okay. Didn't ask if the chairs are straight in the sanctuary. Didn't ask all those logistical kinds of things. But just... I miss being with my church family. There comes a time for all of us when we have an epiphany and we realize that what, mat what really matters most is being able to look in each other's eyes and enjoy each other's company. Bring all your family, Joseph. But you don't need to bring any of your things. The best that Egypt has to offer is at your disposal. And God says, seek me first. Seek my kingdom and its righteousness above everything else. And whatever you need, the best of heaven is yours. I'll provide it. Lord, I pray this morning that you would continue to help me to live what I'm preaching. We get sidetracked and we confess it. But when we look at this story in Genesis, it brings us back to realize that people, relationships, our priority. And everything else is replaceable. I mean, it really is.
Everything else can be replaced. But to love our spouse and to love our kids and to love our grandkids and to love our church family and to love our neighbors and our friends who are around us, that's irreplaceable. So let your word work in in our lives today to bring us in alignment with the biblical values that you bring before us day after day as we open that book. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. These altars are open.